thank you for joining us. Um, great to good. meet you. And I think I've spent some time with you over recent months as we've put content, etc. together, um, hugely invested in what you've um, done as an individual um, in terms of Wiser. But for those that don't know, talk to us a bit about Wiser, where it's come from and, and why you do it. Absolutely. First of all, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been my dream for the last four, four five years to bring all the HR talent recruitment professionals in the insurance sector together to discuss some of the challenges and opportunities that we have and at least collectively it's the first event try to attempt to solve some of the problems that we have so thank you very much for coming and thank you to ILC for helping us organize and put this wonderful event together so my name is Crescens for ease you can call me Cress if you if we interact later on um, yeah CEO but is a glorified training manager. That's how I see my, my role on a day-to-day -day basis. We started as the internal training department of a very large broking company uh, with an owl in its logo. I can't mention the name because we've sold that business to a bigger entity. So we were the training arm of that business and I joined as the HR director for that particular business when it was just 200 employees. And our business plan was to grow that from 200 to 1,200 in two years' time. So not at the scale of 25,000 recruiter in a year, but 1,000 employees in two years in a highly affluent, low unemployment rate area uh, in, in Hampshire. So that was my challenge. And we had the same uh, questions. Is it going to be based on salary? I think at that time, flexible working was not the buzzword because that was way back in 2010. Um, so the next alternative was career development. Of course, that's, what, that's why we all start our jobs and try to retain and stay in business. So we decided salary, yes, we can be competitive, but how do we offer something, something better in order to retain people? So we said we will take chocolate fountains and other fancy things out of the equation from an engagement point of view and offer development and help build people's career. Um, so I spent close to a million pounds in the first year of my role in training and development, setting up a proper infrastructure, training rooms, hired about 15, 20 trainers uh, and other support functions. And the CEO and I was traveling back from London, and that's when he said, Chris, put down the cost of what we have spent this year. And we wrote everything down, and it's about 800,000 pounds we've spent so far. And he said, you better find your own money next year because the rest of the board are not very happy <laughs> that we have spent close to a million pounds. So we borrowed a sheet of paper from a fellow passenger and plotted the concept for Wiser Academy. So it was a cost neutralizing exercise, cost cutting exercise. So every time we train our staff, mainly for professional qualifications and soft skills and customer service and so on, we used to open up the opportunity to other brokers and claims businesses to send their staff. So I have 10 of my staff and there's three chairs vacant there and we used to market that and charge a minimum fee for people to send their staff to get them qualified. And that's how we started Wiser Academy, filling empty seats in our training classrooms, uh, giving other brokers, smaller brokers or smaller TPA organizations with no internal training facility to benefit from it. Fast forward 12 months, we were turning over a million pounds. So we started bringing our own revenue to cover the cost of the training department. Uh, and that's, it grew and it grew and it grew. But we wanted to offer something more meaningful in addition to standard induction training, some soft skills and customer service. So we started providing CII qualifications. So everyone in the business will have achieved their level three qualification. And that meant it added a further cost because the qualifications are very expensive. It's a thousand pounds per head to get your level three. And I thought, oh, where, can, where else can we find more money to cover that cost? And I just put into Google government subsidies for training and apprenticeships popped up. Um, and we engaged with a training provider and started delivering apprenticeships. But the 
experience was not very good for our learners. There was one trainer, 200 learners, and it was a tick box exercise. There was no real meaning added to the development. So I spoke to the training provider and said, I'll give you three of my trainers, and they will do the training. You pay the cost of my three trainers. So I've tried to offset further cost, and it paid for the CII exams as well. So we did that for about six months, and then I thought, well, we're doing most of the training and exam preparations and stuff, so what else is the government paying this training provider? Um, so I put my training manager to task, and we got ourselves approved by the government to deliver the first apprenticeships as an employer provider in the financial services sector after HSBC, I think it was us, who could deliver our own apprenticeships. And that word uh, spread in the market and other brokers said, we also want to get uh, the free training to cover the cost of the exams. And that's when I formally launched Wiser Academy as an independent training provider. Um, and now we run that. So we sold the brokerage. So this is my, my business now that I focus on. That's where we've come from. So quite busy then, Chris, I think yeah. I, would, I, would, I would have said in the last few years. And we'll be hearing later from UCAS in terms of apprenticeships and, and, and how that can work more. And I know there's so much we could talk about today, yeah. um, but time is always limited. So if we were to start with, I guess, the most important things that you would want to get across in terms of that kind of attracting talent, what do we need to do? What's the key messages and important things we need to think about? So, yeah, talent is, is a challenge, trying to find and then offering meaningful opportunities to retain them and keeping them happy and flexible. But when we talk about training and development, we usually talk about skills that have already arrived. And you can see on the slide, you know, there's, we need to look at it in a completely different way. And I'll give you an example. And when I saw this logo uh, over here, it reminded me, that's where I started my career. <laughs> Um, so skills that have arrived, your customer service, your complaints handling, your consumer duty basics, and we spend an awful lot of time developing people in that. But we need to focus on skills that are in progress. It's not yet mainstream, but it's about to happen. But most certainly we've completely avoid that skills in anticipation. Sometimes they're called skills in conflict because we sit and debate, no, that will never happen. Uh, chat GPT will never become mainstream aspect mm -hmm. of our day-to-day -day work. I started working in an Indian call center supporting, back then it was called Eagle Star, and I think Zurich bought Eagle Star, mm -hmm. probably <laughs> you know that. And I remember in 2002, we were trained as trainers on how to deliver virtual classroom trainings. We had a Citrix or Cisco platform, and we used to be trained by the trainers in the UK back in India, and similarly, we used to train people from India back in the UK and Poland and other places. And we were given training in 2003-04 on how to deliver virtual classrooms training. And that is an example of skills and anticipation. Zurich team really anticipated there's a way of doing that. There is a need for that. And fast forward to 2012, when I implemented the first ever virtual CII training platform under Wiser Academy, it was no means new or difficult because I knew exactly how to implement that. I knew what to pass on to my trainers on how to facilitate a good uh, virtual classroom training. And then fast forward to 2020, when the rest of the world was running around understanding Zoom and Teams, we were business as usual. And that is an example I want to draw. Focusing on skills and anticipation is a way to be ahead of the curve when it comes to talent development. So what sort of examples could you give us as we stand today? What are the skills and anticipation we might want to think about? So I mentioned, I mentioned ChatGPT. So how many of you have thought of developing skills in something called prompt writing? Mm. You have? Good. There's only one hand. And that is a skill that we will all need in the next 12 to 18 months' time. What, what is it, just a for me? Prompt clearly... writing is to, is to understand the, the structure and the sequence of how the AI language works and how chat GPT things, so that when you put in a question, you'll get the most appropriate, relevant 
answer. So basically, a particular way of thinking and writing to interact with an AI machine. Okay. So you're saying in anticipation, we all need to be signed up to that yeah, so, and do a bit of research. Yeah, prompt writing is an example of the future skill under skills in anticipation. Okay. Agile working was a mainstream skill under IT and project management, but it is trickling down into day-to-day -day general team working. So agile working is something that's just evolving. It's in progress. I think we need to adapt that and get people to understand that. And that makes problem solving and uh, pr uh, productivity much better. Okay. And as Shana had mentioned as well, seeing a bit of a change in terms of maybe some talent pool, that it's not just technical. Yep. skills anymore mm -hmm. um, and that there are some um, tech out there that will take away some parts of the claim processing mm -hmm. um, so what does that look like in terms of a landscape then Chris? So I think there's three I think it's in grey you can't probably read uh, so the future jobs all routine and transactional jobs will get automated and what will be left over is non-routine which is knowledge based jobs and for you to be able to deliver knowledge-based jobs, you should have the fundamental foundation knowledge, hard skills, as we call it. Then the future jobs are the ones for the smart, the educated, and people who embrace lifelong learning. And there's a lot of noise about what will be the exact future skills of the, fu uh, uh, of the future. And if we can narrow everything down into creativity, uh, problem solving, critical thinking, and I think there was mention earlier about emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, attention management. We'll be left with so much time, we wouldn't, still don't know what to do with it, and you'll still be running out of time. So attention management in old terms is time management. These are the neutral skills that we need to develop to be able to stay afloat and be ahead of the curve. Technical skills and technology will continue to evolve but the confidence and the uh, courage to embrace that and deal with it comes from these neutral skills. And as much as technology progresses, it's, only, it's going to create some problems for us. Uh, ChatGPT can chuck out something totally uh, incorrect. How do you know? How do you critically analyze that and validate that and use some of the inputs to solve a problem within the context of your business? So critical problem solving creativity is this future skill okay so some key learns in terms of what we need to think about future wise anticipation as well as the progress and um, talking about then i guess talent pools and mm -hmm. looking at um how we can as an industry open up some new talent pools yes. or consider new talent pools i know there's quite a lot of work that wise has done so yep. let's talk about that so when we used to go and exhibit in schools and colleges, we, we have our broking brand career opportunities. Uh, young people are absolutely not interested because next to us is British Airways and next to us is Deloitte's and KPMG's and so on. And people flock to those industries because they are quite established and insurance for some reason is not well known, it's not as sexy as other industries. Why? Um, I don't know, what, what? it's probably the kind of image we uh, <laughs> portray or we don't make an effort to reach out to people. So, but we can break that mold and we've been making headwinds and breaking that barrier, but we need to constantly and relentlessly reach out to young people. So I have created a program called Rise Up, it's a social campaign and our, our objective is to reach out to 10,000 school college leavers by the end of October this year with the message about insurance as a meaningful career option. Uh, we're going to invite them to apply for insurance vacancies. We're going to offer them two-day insurance boot camp training to tell them about the jargons that we use, the structure, what's claims, what's customer service, what's uh, actuarial underwriting. Prepare them for an interview, help them write a good CV, and then start putting these CVs and candidates in front of our partners, our customers that we support. So when they sit in front of the person interviewing, they're better prepared, they understand more about the industry, they can use some of the terminologies and impress the employer. So career awareness talk, two-day boot camp, prepare them and place them in each of these businesses. But you will see there's a before we place, there is a 
section that we have added, prepare the employer. Um, most businesses and leaders, I think the average age of our profession, I think it's about 45 plus, and the young people that I'm trying to get them into the business is of a completely different generation, and there's bound to be clashes. Uh, their value systems are different to what we expect, and most young people don't know what to expect and how to behave when they are in an office. Uh, even the basic point about turning up on time mm. has to be taught. <laughs> so, so we're going to prepare the employer as well as part of the Rise Up campaign to say, right, this is the 18-year-old coming into the, your business. This is, what, this is how they think and this is their value systems. It's not their fault. Probably we are. Some of us are to blame in, in, in creating that kind of value system in our young people. Be warned, be prepared. So when the employer is also prepared, then the chances of this person succeeding in the business is higher and then they are ready and that is um, rise up. And, and what sort of job roles then within industry would you be looking to try and support these individuals into getting into employment? What kind of job roles? It's mostly all frontline jobs, you know, from customer service, FNOL and claims and business admin, sales. It can be any frontline job that they uh, young people, school leavers, college leavers can get into. And if there was anyone in the room today that thought, actually, that sounds like a great thing to get involved with, mm -hmm. what, what does that look like, apart from coming to your stand and seeing what you do? You can go to our website, there's a section for Rise Up, and you can pledge. If you say, Wiser Academy, we are prepared to take 10 people, can you help us find 10 school, college leavers or graduates? And we will do all the background work and help you find that talent uh, and place in your business. But once they are placed in your business, we need to offer them some structured training. And that's why we have a kickstart program. And I think we have trained about 1,000 people since we launched it in January, I think. So it's a free training for businesses. If you have a new person starting in your work, and before they sit next to someone and learn on the job, if you want to offer them some structured training into what is insurance, what is claims, the different departments and claims, third party damage and third party recoveries and so on, you send them to our two day free introduction to insurance training. They'll understand all the jargons of what is an excess and how does it, you know, how do people buy insurance, what happens if they have a car accident who do they call and then what happens. So they understand the framework and they, put, they are put through an exam, an assessment, they get a certificate and then you, they can sit next to someone and learn the systems and processes and scripts. That makes their learning a little more easier and faster and more embedded. So that's kickstart for young people or older people fresh into insurance. They can go through that. And just touch on apprenticeships as well um, mm. and the, the option um, to become qualified in insurance and to get a degree. Mm. Um, what does that look like as a, as a program? And do you think there's, be, that there's more of a shift now to people wanting to not just take the path of going to university after college? Yes. That's a yes, OK. And why? Why has there been a shift then? Well, I think uh, you will hear from UCAS later this afternoon. Um, people are... Uh, trying to understand, they're getting to understand all the opportunities. Uh, universities, I think, if people are smarter, I think they're going to avoid that because you go into a three-year degree, maybe an English literature, geography, economics, you spend £60,000 debt uh, and you walk out with no meaningful work experience, £60,000 debt, and you'll probably still end up uh, in doing some kind of frontline job. And from an insurance sector, we have a we, we think we attract the best graduates you know, in, in our talent programs, graduate programs, major insurance companies, but in reality we only get given the leftovers. The creme de la creme is taken by the Deloitte's, the KPMG's and all the big IT companies and we only get mm. leftover graduates. So why wait for uh, uh, leftovers? Go and re recruit good talent right from school and colleges and nurture and develop their career. So we know university is still a preferred option for some of the people and that's why we developed the first ever insurance university degree program. That's not on the slide 
because I was surprised. Social media, which is only in the last 20 years, has got its own university degree program. Does it? Yes. You can do a social media degree in how to use Facebook and Twitter. But insurance, which is about 500 years old, you know, in its, from its early days, doesn't have an insurance degree. So we changed that in 2015, I think, yes. And we developed our first ever insurance degree program. Because diversity, and we mentioned about um, diversity and inclusion, we always look on the other end of the spectrum of the socially, economically uh, not so privileged people. But if you look on the other side of diversity, there are these private educated uh, students uh, who went to private schools and colleges. Why can't we attract them? Because that is equally diversity. But we have to offer something really lucrative, meaningful to them. So to attract the private school educated people into the insurance sector was the trigger point of developing the university degree. Okay. And they are smart. So they come and work for a business after college. Three years ACII industry qualification. The fourth year is a BA honors insurance degree. You walk away with four years of work experience and you've saved, I don't know, 60,000 pounds if you're still living with your mom and dad. Uh, and not 60,000 pounds in terms of university debt. So you think there's a shift? Absolutely. And our job, I guess, as the collective community is to do more about it, to get the word out there and to uh, make it seem a bit more sexy in terms of an industry. Yes. There are 500,000 young people who have expressed their interest in an apprenticeship. Uh, you will hear more about it from UCAS. It's just that one door we have to open and we can find the new generation or the next generation of talent. Okay, wonderful. Um, just for anyone who, who um, doesn't know, we do podcasts within ILC. I recently spent a lovely couple of hours with Chris on a podcast that's due out in the next couple of weeks where you can find out a bit more, a bit in terms of background, but certainly the passion that sits behind it as well. Um, so I'm going to go to Nick for questions unless there's anything else that you want to add before I pass over to Nick for some questions. Well, I just want to to highlight on the apprenticeship side of things because I think um, uh, Shana from Zurich mentioned their apprentices didn't have a good experience or it was difficult. I think it was on the virtual learning, I think. Virtu the virtual yeah. learning side yeah. of things, yes. So young people, we may think they are, they are on their gadgets and stuff, but they still prefer that face-to-face -face social side of things. Young people prefer learning in a classroom from a person um, but again, a, a good apprenticeship has to incorporate the skills in progress, the skills in anticipation, and not just the skills mm. that are established. So if you use apprenticeships in a very effective way, you can package that and create your talent program that meets your present, your immediate future, and the long-term uh, program. Um, most Businesses and learners and training providers use apprenticeships just for the CII qualifications or CILA qualifications, avoiding the skills and behavior. And I think that's doing injustice to your levy port or your, your employees. I think you should focus on creating apprenticeships. It's a, it's a perfect platform if implemented well. And if you implement skills and behavior as part of that, then you get a well-rounded, fully government-funded training program. How many have apprenticeships at the moment? Your organisation that does an apprenticeship? Gosh, oh, no, a few more hands going up. Still not loads, though, is the? If you look around the room, still not loads. So I think we've definitely got some, some work to do. Your guys are around all day today. Yes. Um, the stand's just outside on the left, so when we get through to lunch in about the next 15 or so minutes, please feel free to go up and ask. Nick, do we have any questions at all? We do, Sue. Yeah, we've got a few. So, uh, Chris... Um, we've got four minutes, yeah. Four minutes, right, I'll speak slowly, I've got two. Um, <laughs> what does good virtual training look like and what should be considered to ensure employees and new starters um, re retain engagement? So what does good virtual training session look like? First of all, having the cameras on where, you know, by the learners <laughs> themselves is a good starting point. So one of the key things my trainers really drive from day one is to have the cameras on because that you know that creates that sense of connectivity and so on we need to use interactive platforms you know uh, otherwise it'll be just somebody talking to you so like slido we use something called nearport is that what you guys use 
So bring some interactivity and engagement activities that you typically do in a classroom training into your virtual sessions. But um, most important is keeping the content quite concise, you know, uh, and constantly bringing interactions, you know, verbally interacting with the people, asking questions and keep, keeping them. And no more than um, an hour and a half if you have a, any kind of a formal training, not to do full eight hours and stuff. Uh, so keep it bite-sized uh, and then keep it highly interactive. Sorry, what was the second part of your question? Engaging? Yeah, to, how to keep the employees engaged. Yeah, so even if you are delivering virtual classrooms, we need to have to use our dexterity and motor skills. So our trainers send printed copies of workbooks, so as they're learning, they need to still to be able to write uh, and scribble and highlight and all of those kind of stuff. So if you bring that classroom feel by way of interaction uh, and be able to write and scribble and post it notes and then keep activities on a... Slido or Nearpod kind of platform, then you can really make virtual sessions highly engaging. One more? Go um, on then. Something, Chris, that you, you mentioned during the uh, discussion was lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. um, something that um, I'm very passionate about. I think it's really important. How do employees um, give those pathways of lifelong learning to the new talent that they want to attract? If we can go back, I think, one slide, Sue. Are you challenging me now? Which one? <laughs> Which one do you want? Red yes. Yes. Yeah. I've used a term there called macro learning, micro learning, and exposures. So when a new employee joins, they go through their 10 days or 5 days induction. That's a typical macro learning opportunity. And that will give them a real start. You know, if, if you plot them on a graph, you'll see it's going high because they have the deep foundation they understand and they start, they're productive. But what happens after that, they'll start dipping. Their productivity, knowledge, enthusiasm starts dipping. And that's when we need to feed it with micro-learning. And micro-learning is simple things like videos and blogs and podcasts and articles and bite-sized content and content in the flow of work. So when they're faced with a particular challenge, that's when you need to feed content using technology and platform. And then it starts going back up but then you need to feed that with more macro learning and that's what creates exponential growth in a person's career. So new person, induction training, ongoing bite-sized virtual half an hour training, e-learning, videos, blogs will keep them going. They start dipping down. And that's when you provide them with professional qualifications training or some kind of advanced macro learning, which is pretty medium to long-term program, your CII qualifications and stuff. But well, what really makes a difference is creating exposures. Um, that example of Zurich training me in 2002 on virtual, virtual training, I was not a trainer, I was just a call center employee at that time. But some of us were given an opportunity to just sit behind the trainer and observe this new world of virtual training. So that was an exposure I got. The conference here if uh, there are junior members of staff or people who are considering HR training, if they're attending this event, this is an exposure. Yep. They get to meet and network. So creating exposures is what really influences behavior. And macro plus micro plus exposures is what creates lifelong learning. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. So this is genuine, as I say, just a flavor of, of what Chris can talk about in terms of and talent and training so please do make the most of him for the rest of today uh, ask the questions that we need but for now Chris that's been amazing so thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.